By the grace of Christ, my brethren, let us read from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18, and verse 21. Chapter 19, 19, Acts 19, and verse 21. When these things were accomplished, let's read from 17 better. Verse 17. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Aristus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. <clears throat> so not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into dis disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised, and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath, and cried out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion, and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's companions, travel companions, and when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him, pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not know why they had come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander motioned with his hands, and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the city clerk had quiet, quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jesus, from Jews, from Zeus, forgive me. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if... Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, 
it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar, there being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. And when they had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Amen. Paul, a few years earlier, in reality, in 19, uh, forgive me, in 50 AD, around seven years before this moment that we read about today, he had decided to go to Ephesus and preach the gospel. But he had learned now that he never started out to do something unless he had instruction and guidance by the Holy Spirit. And while he was searching to find where the Holy Spirit wants him to preach in Mysia and in other places, he found himself in a dead end in Troas, not knowing where and what he must do. The guidance that he was seeking and he was receiving back then and always from the moment that the Lord chose him and sent him by the Holy Spirit on his mission, his guidance, the guidance of God brought him to a dead end not knowing what to do. And when he found himself in this dead end, not because of his thoughts, which is definite because our counsels and our ways will lead our life into dead ends. And because he knows that this dead end doesn't have an opening and he needs to turn back. That's why he never started unless he had complete instruction and guidance by the Holy Spirit. But behold, the absolute instruction of the Holy Spirit brought him again to a dead end. And so, he did what he had to do. Without worries, without anxiety, he waited to see what God would tell him. And God, with a vision showed him that he had to go not to Asia, but to Greece, which thing he did. And the gospel then was preached throughout the whole of Greece, the beginning being made from Philip to Corinth, but also all of Greece. His apostolic trip was over, and a new trip, God prepares a new trip for him, the third trip, and this time God leads him. There were five years ago Paul wanted to go on his own. But God wanted him to go after five years. And that is Ephesus. And there in Ephesus, because God knows all things and Paul's know it and, God, and Paul trusts him, all things were prepared then. There were 12 disciples of Apollos there who had heard the things concerning Jesus Christ by Apollo who was mighty in word and in spirit. They were baptized in the baptism of John. When Apollos left, the Apostle Paul found himself there. When he asked them a question that the Apostle Paul always made, since you believe, have you believed, believing in Jesus Christ, have you received the Holy Spirit? The twelve disciples said, we don't even know if it exists. And he says, how do you say this? Were you not baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? How do you not know about the Holy Spirit? And then they testified that no, we were not baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's why they do not know things concerning the Holy Spirit. But they were baptized in the baptism of John, of repentance. And having submitted 
to the right division of, of, the, ho of the Holy Spirit, of the Gospel, the dogmas that the Apostle Paul presented them of the Apostles, they were baptized in water in the name of Christ, and they were all filled in the Holy Spirit, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And from then on, the greatest blessing that the Apostle Paul ever lived in his ministry began. All of Asia heard the word of God. Soothsayers, sorcerers, were turned and converted. And they were added by the Lord to the church of Christ. Great signs and wonders were performed by Jesus. So that even handkerchiefs and coverings of Paul they sent around and the sick were healed. One and a half years he sat there. And again, with the instruction of the Holy Spirit, he decided in himself that he had to go to Jerusalem and from there to leave and go to Rome. Tied and bound in the Holy Spirit, he said later on, that is, he had the guidance of God, the instruction, the, the order from God, leave Ephesus, go to Jerusalem, and from there, go to Rome, because there I have work of God for you. In Jerusalem, you will confess the name of Jesus Christ to your fellow countrymen, for which you have a great pain for their salvation you hurt for them for their salvation because they worship God but not with knowledge but then after that you will go to Rome and there you will confess Jesus Christ in the Praetorian and in Caesar's house even so bound in the spirit so that wherever he went the Holy Spirit revealed that bond bondage and suffering awaits him and dangers of death but the Apostle Paul testified that I do not want I do not tend to any of this nor do I have my life precious except the thing that I care about is for me to finish my road with joy and my ministry that I received from God to make it perfect and complete he is a winner because with his life God is glorified and the devil is mocked. And it is revealed through the word of God what the mind from the Apostle Paul is which is described in the book of Revelation of John saying that they overcome and they will overcome who have three characteristics. First of all, the blood of Jesus Christ cleans them from all sin because they have fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. Secondly, because they do not deny the name of Christ, but they testify Jesus Christ to Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And thirdly, because they do not love their soul more than Christ. Because Christ said, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life because of me, he will win it. But this short time span where the Apostle Paul, with a perfect guidance, decided to leave, and for that reason, he sent Timothy and Erastus ahead, young men who could not withstand the trial that was going to call him, come upon them. He was, he was also going to experience the greatest trial and tribulation of his life, concerning which later on in his letter to the Corinthians testifies and says that, My brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant concerning the tribulation which happened to us in Asia that we were exceedingly 
sorrowful above all our strength so that we would despair even of living. But beyond this, besides this, we've made the decision of death lest we have trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead. Now let us see now what this trial for which the Apostle Paul testifies and the Word of God reveals to us that there was no greater than this. So while he sent Timothy and Aristus ahead, and I say, and may God have mercy upon me if I'm mistaking, because they would not stand, they could not bear what was going to happen because God would never lay something upon us more than what we can bear. So when they left, when he settled everything, when God put everything in order, suddenly, out of the blue, without a reason, in just a few hours, a disaster begins that is terrifying. Some smilversmith, Demetrius, who created gods and temples from silver dedicated to Diana, when he saw the work of God growing and giving responsibility not to God, who doesn't know, whom he doesn't know, but to Paul, whom he can see, he said, we're, we're destroyed, we're gone. All of Asia, not only Ephesus, because of this man. He's changing everything. And he doesn't seek the temples that I want, that I create, and the gods that I create. We are coming to an end financially because of this man. It is this man's fault, not God's fault, who is the one at fault, truly, but God, but Paul, who is also at fault because he is doing the will of God. And so he manages, not he, Demetrius, but the devil who is behind him, to stir up a whole city. They arrest Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's companions. And here now he finds himself, the Apostle Paul finds himself in the great dilemma as he sees that Aristarchus has been arrested and Gaius the Macedonians and there is a crowd who is ready to lynch them the trial and the problem of Paul wasn't if he were gonna die but he could not bear to watch the people that he loves die. The disciples told him, don't go. Don't go because they will kill you. But he wasn't afraid. It is, it is sure he testifies concerning his death. He was ready to die. But he had a serious dilemma. On one hand, he had the instruction of God to go to Jerusalem and then to, Ro to Rome for the glory of God. And on the other hand, he wanted to go and die with the ones that he loved. This is the thing that he couldn't stand, he couldn't bear it, and he co confessed that he was even desperate of living. It is the crucial point which will make God be glorified in the life of Paul and, to, and the devil will be become disgraced before the glory of God. What will you do? Death for him has no no meaning. He confesses and it's a lot better for me to be with Christ. Besides, he proved this because he died. He was butchered. 
but other. There's another dilemma here. On one hand, there's the glory of God and his obedience to God. And on the other hand, there's the great love. Where the love of God by the Holy Spirit was filling his heart. Who will win? And it is the trial of Job's wife. It is the trial of Job. It is the trial of a servant, manservant, a maidservant of God. Who will prevail? For the decision, the glory of God on one hand, or the compassion and the labor and the pain of love of God for men. It is the dilemma of God the Father. Whom will he sacrifice? His only begotten Son, so that he may cr be crushed, because only in this way will the devil be crushed on the ca head of Calvary and the cross of Calvary. Whom will he sacrifice? <coughs> he sacrifices his compassion, the pain of his love for his glory. Now what prevails? What will become greater in the thought of the Apostle Paul? I believe that at that moment all the heavens were silent waiting to see who would be glorified and who would be reproached. The angels, the archangels, the cherubim, the seraphim, all motionless, standing before the decision of Paul, before the decision of an insignificant man. All of the heavens were silent. What will this man do now? What will he choose? Will he become discouraged before this pain of love that he's feeling? Or will he overcome? Or will the zeal for the glory of God overcome? And this dilemma, my dear brethren, is not only of Paul, but it is of every one of us which God chose in righteousness and Christ added to his church. The solution of the problem is very easy. The decision is very difficult. And Paul says, we have made the decision of death. We no longer hope he was so weak, so wretched, so insignificant and, and small that I no longer hope in me. But I have the secret of victory. I hope in God who raises the dead. Here is the secret of, mi of victory. Here is the secret of triumph, of Job, of God, of Paul, and yours. I do not hope in me and in anyone at all. My hope is in God who raises the dead. I hope in a God that there's nothing impossible for him. All things are possible. All things are scheduled by him. He has prepared all things. 
and he is asking from you, the insignificant, who is nothing, to do the greatness, to disgrace the devil and Satan, to shame him with one weapon, your hope in God. One hope that is safe and secure. A hope that doesn't disgrace. A hope through which God is glorified and the devil is put to shame. How does he transform? How does God transform? An insignificant man that is called Job Someone there in the east at some time in the past. He is transformed into a hero. A triumphant winner. To the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. Similar to the father who sacrificed his son. Similar to him. How does God transform a persecutor of the true church of Christ who being faithful to his traditions he accused and swore and persecuted the heresy as they said back then of the Nazarenes Testifying that this thing that you call a heresy. I tell you that this is what is written in the scriptures. It is the truth. It is the absolute truth. But until then. With great authority. He went to persecute the heretics until Jesus Christ as he always does, seeing not the thing that is now, Saul back then, did not look at what Saul was back then, but what would happen afterward, and that is Paul. He would be turned into Paul. Because it doesn't matter what you are and what I am now, what matters is what will God make you, and whom will he turn you into then? And he takes the one who says, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I was a persecutor. He takes this insignificant man and he brings him to the height of a giant of faith. To the height of the triumph. To the height of the glory of God. And of the shame of the devil. And one weapon. None other. I do not hope and trust in myself. But I hope in God who raises the dead. I know that I am tested now. And I have to come out as approved. He realizes that what he is going through is his trial. And he has to come out approved and qualified. God has to be glorified. He has to stand faithful in the instruction and guidance of the Holy Spirit. He has to surpass the pain of love for his brethren that are perishing. And he has to submit to the word of God and the glory of God. And he does this. The solution is easy. The scribe was afraid when he saw the exceeding exceedingness of the uh, of the indignation of these people. Does this remind you of anything? They said, Great is the Artemis of the Ephesians. He became afraid. He said, Well, what's gonna happen to us with the Romans? They're gonna call consider this an uproar and a rebellion, so he quiets them down. But it's not that he only quiets them down. It is that God tied the devil because Paul won through Jesus Christ. 
Now the devil has no power. He can do nothing. He is bound. He set him free just for a while because God trusted Paul in the way that he trusted Job that through him the name of the Lord will be glorified. And in a, just a few minutes as he sta- suddenly begun in the same way it suddenly went out. In just a few minutes as Job lost everything suddenly so also God gave him double suddenly. Why? Because he won. Don't be afraid. I have overcome. You will also overcome. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Your faith. Amen.